Hi, I'm Mary Lee from Better At School. In this step, I'd like to share a brief history of design and look closely at how design's role in our world has changed. The profession of design emerged with the Industrial Revolution, but the role of design as a tool of culture and an instrument of social change emerged with the dawn of civilization. In the ancient world, designers were anonymous. We don't know who designed the ancient monuments, but we can guess that they were probably priests, astronomers, or other learned men. These structures were intended to please the gods and express the power of the ruling elite. During the Roman Empire, architecture and design were used to institute order and acculturate foreigners as well as express the power of the imperial state. Under Julius Caesar, the calendar that organized daily life was redesigned, and for the first time, the coins used by ordinary citizens bore a likeness of the emperor. Artifacts like these helped to spread the order and values of Roman civilization to the furthest reaches of the empire. In the Middle Ages, designers emerged as artisans, manufacturing small batches of goods for local markets. But the invention of the printing press in 1436 marked the beginning of what would become the profession of graphic design. Gutenberg's press enabled printers to publish large volumes of original work, stimulating the growth of literacy and a commercial market for printed information. The reign of Queen Victoria in England brought the Industrial Revolution and with it the efficient mass production of consumer goods and a burgeoning commercial economy. One of the first industries to benefit was the textile industry. The invention of the spinning jenny and the power loom enabled the production of mass quantities of high quality cloth. And the invention of the sewing machine made it possible to mass produce clothing. Couturiers, designers who handmade custom clothing for wealthy clients, had been around since 4th century China. But it wasn't until the tools of mass production collided with the new popular media in the early 20th century that couturiers began to offer ready-to-wear apparel and the new profession of fashion design emerged. During the late 19th and early 20th century, designers added visual panache to mass-produced goods that captured consumers' attention and gave smart manufacturers an edge. By mid-century, graphic design, fashion design, and industrial design had not only helped fuel the economy, but joined architecture as a significant driver of American culture, thanks in part to a small number of extremely talented and high-profile designers. But as successful as it was in helping to drive growth in the American economy, design was still primarily concerned with helping companies figure out how to win by designing beautiful products and positioning them through advertising for greatest impact in the market. Design was not present in the boardroom where strategy was made, in other words, where companies decided where to play. And a key reason for this was economic. After World War II, American consumers still had limited choice in the marketplace, so demand for most products remained strong. Marketers studied consumer purchasing behavior in order to make educated guesses about which product improvements or brand extensions to introduce to the market. And this worked, due in no small part to the fact that in the relationship between producer and consumer, producers still held more of the power. Then in the 1970s, everything changed. Global trade accelerated, bringing scores of new products into American markets. Suddenly, companies were facing intense competition and a marketplace that was changing faster than anyone could respond to it, and the development of computer technology only accelerated it. And this has been design's great opportunity, because the true value of design lies in its ability to quickly bring shape to ambiguity to reveal order and complexity, and to discern where new opportunities lie. The last 10 years has seen an explosion of design thinking in almost every part of enterprise, including the making of business strategy. How did this happen? 
To find the answer, we have to look back at what was happening at the fringes of the design profession during its heyday in the 1950s, and at the work of an industrial designer named Jay Doblin, who was then director of the Institute of Design at Illinois Institute of Technology. Jay's great insight was that the practice of design could be improved with rules-based design systems. In the 1970s, Jay summarized his ideas in an article called The Seven Levels of Design that described the different levels at which designers could approach a design challenge. For example, at level one, the designer accepts the current performance of a product and simply cleans up its physical form. A good example of this is the redesign of the Briars ice cream carton. The carton's function as a container of ice cream and holder of product information hasn't changed, but the graphic design has been simplified and aesthetically improved. At level two, the designer makes performance improvements. A good example of this is the OXO line of kitchen utensils. The founder of OXO wanted to make it easier for a family member with arthritis to peel potatoes. He discovered that even people who didn't have arthritis would pay more for common utensils that featured his chubby rubber grips and ergonomic designs. At level three, the designer may change the basic mechanism of the product. A good example of this is the cordless phone. The cord that formerly delivered the phone signal has been removed and its function taken over by a new technology. At level four, the designer may include in the design products which are outside the company's control. A good example of this is eBay and PayPal. Prior to eBay's acquisition of PayPal, over half of eBay's users used PayPal to complete their transactions. At level five, the designer may completely change the service performed by the product, eliminating the physical product altogether. A good example of this is digital media. Prior to the invention of digital recording, records and movies were physical objects. Now music and movies are purchased or subscribed to online and no physical object changes hands. At level six, the designer eliminates one or more of the services performed by the product. A good example of this is Zipcar. One of the services car ownership provides is around the clock access to a vehicle in exchange for the purchase cost, financing cost, insurance cost, registration cost, and maintenance cost. A Zipcar membership offers somewhat less access, but significantly lower cost. At level seven, the industry itself is transformed. An emerging example of this may be professional journalism. As the internet has become the main news source for most people, the cost of professional news reporting has come under close scrutiny, with many media companies downsizing or even eliminating news gathering operations. Jay's seven level framework is a useful way to think about almost any kind of problem. As you move up the ladder, strategic options expand and tactical considerations take a more subordinate role. The framing of options in this way can make it easier to match resources, tools, and objectives to the most appropriate approach. Finally, Jay's framework is also a wonderful sketch of the range of value designers bring to the world today.